All right. Welcome, everyone, to another, uh, I guess, episode, we'll call this, of Macabre Daily Interviews. My name is Matt Orozco, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. I'll, I'll get to why in just a moment, but I want to introduce my guest today, which is Renee Rivas. And Renee and I go um, way back to, like, middle school, uh, I think, in Tucson, Arizona, <laughs> and uh, talking about horror movies. And Renee is someone who, over the years, has done what everyone talks about and actually made it his passion and his purpose. So he's a director, writer, producer, cinematographer, composer. I'm sure I'm missing a few things in there and done about 13 different shorts and documentary films, including films like Northern, a fantastic Halloween fan film, Spirit of Haddonfield, that you can watch now on YouTube, uh, The Tent. And the one we're here to talk about today, the most recent one, is Judy. So Renee, um, Welcome. And is there anything uh, else you know you want anyone to know about yourself? Uh, you know who you are, where you come from. Before we get to some questions, um, I guess I'll just do a formal introduction for myself. As Matt said, my name is Renee Rebus, and I am a writer, director, and producer, cinematographer based out of Flagstaff, Arizona. And Matt Orozco and I go back to probably 1997. To Sounds the right. To the Orange Grove Middle School days in Tucson, Arizona, and now we're adults pushing 40, and it's it feels really good to get connected again. But it does. Um, um, yeah, that's my formal introduction. I'm currently in Flagstaff, Arizona. I've been here about 13 years. I own and operate my production company, Renee Rivas Productions, here in Flagstaff for the last seven years. And um, in the next hopefully handful of months. I'm going to be relocating out to the Burbank, California area with my girlfriend to, you know, see where it takes my career and take that next level to, you know, expand and continually learn as a filmmaker, writer, and director, and uh, just see where it takes me. That's outstanding. And I think it's, you know, it's funny because for so long, like, I remember we would go, I remember one particular trip, we went to your parents' house in Nogales, we walked to the Blockbuster and rented some horror oh, movies. Man. And like we, there was, at, at that particular point in time, there was nobody else that I knew that was talking about horror movies. And it felt like, you know, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this because I have a bunch of questions about Judy, but you know, we grew up at a particular time when you didn't have access to community in the same way, you know, like you didn't have the internet to kind of, know that there were other people who were interested in the same kinds of movies that you were or the same kinds of things. So I'm just wondering for you, you know, like, has this been quite a surreal experience kind of seeing what it was like to be a fan of something, but not have much of a frame of reference outside of that to now being in a position where, you know, it's almost the, uh, the zeitgeist is a brace horror in, in the best possible way. I just want to start off by saying, first and foremost, I can't believe you remember that we walked to Blockbuster because that was like a three to five mile walk. And we must have been like 12 years old, which was a big no no. Because <laughs> as you mentioned, I grew up in Nogales, Arizona um, until I was about 12 years old. And then I moved to Tucson, Arizona. And, you know, granted, it was a safe community and a safe town. It is a border town. So that is a little sketchy for 12 year olds to be walking three to five miles to blockbuster video and back. But um, <clears throat> I feel like I'm veering off topic at this point. What was the question again? Well, no, I just think it's, it's surreal now that we have a place where like horror as a community has come so far. And I was wondering, has it been surreal for you, especially since you've been producing and creating horror films, you know, to kind of see this point where is it was kind of a very singular thing or kind of a very personal thing to be a horror fan where you didn't have a frame of reference to others whereas now like is that is that a surreal thing for you to see or are you or you kind of think like it's, it's, it's a matter of time I mean I, I kind of feel like it was the natural progression for me personally uh with having a video camera in my hand from age 13 on you know I don't know if you remember I always I don't think it was as prevalent in middle school, I definitely was still filming a lot, of, a lot of stuff, but I just, I filmed everything from a teenager up until my early 20s. And then <clears throat> as I grew older, I worked on learning new techniques of filming. <clears throat> and then in my early 20s, I was in a rock band. And that's really kind of where 
I decided I wanted to step it up and take take it to the next level aside from just being like documentarian and filming it, everything. And then in 20, 2010, when I was 25 years old, that's when I made my first feature, Brothers Gal Video 5, which was a 93 minute documentary covering life on the road. And I guess the whole idea of narrative filmmaking was just kind of brewing inside my head versus just documenting everything. Like, yeah, that's cool that I'm documenting everything, but let's start forming it together into a narrative. And I guess that was kind of the, the springboard of um, taking it to the next level versus just uh, documenting everything with, you know, a Sony Handycam, a eight millimeter Handycam, a mini DV cam. Um, and then as I grew older, I just, horror has always been there. And horror, horror has always been a driving factor for me as a filmmaker. And I do hope and plan to dive into other genres and subgenres. But as of right now, horror is where I'm spending my energy and I just really enjoy it. But um, yeah, you know, it's, I, I guess it's just kind of the natural progression. I, I, if you would have asked me 10, 15 years ago, did I think I was going to be down a path of writing and directing and producing? No, I, you know, I was just going through the motions of life, but this is kind of just what's presented itself to me and um, I'm all in. That's awesome. I mean, as I think I've told you before, you know, there's folks that talk about doing it and there's people that actually go and do it. And that's really what separates those that um, I think ultimately make the progress um, against that goal. Uh, I talk to a lot of independent filmmakers and that's the number one thing they all say is that, hey, you know, the difference between me and the other person who's, who's trying to be me is just that I, you know, I went out and did it. Uh, but I think that's the hardest part uh, of, of all of this. But um, what I'm, what I'm really curious about is first and foremost, you know, you have a, you have a short film, Judy, making the rounds across various film festivals. Um, and I, um, our review is up at Macabre Daily. So for those that are curious to know kind of what's it like, it's a spoiler free review. So please go check it out. Um, but I'm wondering how did you arrive at the concept, you know, slash story for Judy? Um, what was your process? And more importantly, was there anything that influenced you when you were coming up with, with the narrative? See, that's a really interesting story. And I'm currently working on the behind the scenes documentary, which is going to be about a 40 minute documentary um, about a 24 minute short film. <laughs> and there's chapters in the documentary that go back to the, the, the preliminary inception of what became Judy. But I guess the impetus behind the whole movement that became Judy the project was a friend of mine posted a picture hiking around a decrepit uh, building. And I sent her a message. I was like, wow, what, what location is this? This is a really cool location. I want to make a horror short there. And it happened to be the, McCall uh, the McAllister Ranch Barn here in Flagstaff, which is a historic building dating back to the you know, late 19th century. Um, so basically, it, seeing a decrepit location on social media is what drew me to go to that location by myself. This was at the beginning of the pandemic, so this was probably about April 2020. So as a social distancing practice, I went out there, brought some camera gear, brought some lighting and g and &E gear, and just set up some shots with the intention of creating a fake movie trailer. And that's what I ended up doing over the span of about four days, just going, going there by myself <clears throat> and uh, filming a sequence of shots and putting together a fake little one minute trailer. And with, uh, with putting together that one minute, uh, minute trailer, that was kind of the springboard on pitching it to producer Brian Goff and producer Vincent DeSanti, which then you know garnered interest on their behalf. And then they came into the project, but um, the whole project, Judy, <clears throat> was formed from a seeing a picture on social media of a decrepit building. Wow. I feel like a lot of, um, you know, it's not uncommon, particularly for horror fans, to look at a place and be like, wow, that would be a great horror movie there. Like, I just moved to Ohio, and we, you know, we were just driving through some forest land yesterday, and there's all these houses that, like, looked exactly like this is where Texas Chainsaw Massacre could happen, you know, minus the minus all the shrubbery around. So it's, it's interesting to hear that the inspiration kind of just happened. But again, the execution is kind of that next step of not only having that idea, but also like, let's go see what a trailer might look like. Um, so also, that's kind of wild. 
Also, I think it's important to say that I'm trying to keep it as diverse as possible with my filmography. Um, with, you know, with Northern, unfortunately, that was a film that was never released, but I feel like that's going to be a project 10 years down the line of, oh, that's Renee's little uh, college uh, thesis movie or whatever. That's his little super independent sci-fi noir thriller that eventually will get released. So that was kind of a sci-fi noir thriller. And then The Spirit of Haddonfield was a tip of the hat to John Carpenter's Halloween, my all-time favorite horror movie. And uh, that falls into the slasher sub subgenre. And then um, The Tent is kind of a funny amalgam of a bunch of different things, but it kind of circles around like its own self-contained creep show segment or Twilight Zone segment. It's not necessarily scary. It's more creepy. Um, so that's kind of like a uh, supernatural horror thriller. And then with Judy, I don't want to jump into the in any spoiler territory, but Judy jumps into the genres and subgenres that are respective to that storyline. But um, just trying to keep it versatile. And what I'm going, where I'm going with here is upon arriving to the McAllister Ranch location and putting together this fake little movie trailer, I was thinking to myself, I was like, what kind of story can I tell here? And then boom, it hit me like lightning. This is the kind of story that I'm gonna tell here. I haven't done this yet. And that's what turned into the, uh, the uh, skeleton and bare bones of what Judy became. Wow. I mean, I, I think it's, again, to avoid spoilers, I think that what Judy does so well is it feels like something that is non-periodic in as far as, in far as its place, but it's pulling from all these things that kind of, it seems to draw inspiration from decades of horror, you know, like all of the different kind of like from the score down to the visuals, you know, some of it gives me shades of like, oh, there's some A24 kind of really kind of high art looking concepts here. But at the same time, there's also this really deep kind of gritty 70s uh, horror kind of feeling to it where it's not safe. You know, you don't know what's going to happen next. And I'm wondering, were there films that as you were going through the creative process, you were looking back to and saying, I really think I can draw some inspiration from this. Or was that not even a, a question at the time? You're like, wow, this is just the way I see it in my head. And, and that's how it came out to be. I mean, if I were to say that I didn't draw any inspirations from any of my, you know, directors or contemporary directors, that would be, that would, that wouldn't be true in the slightest. There's a lot of areas in the short film that are tipping of the hats, but I feel like not on the nose, but, no. um, you know, like for instance, there's, there's some nightmare sequences that are highly inspired from Kubrick's The Shining. And um, as far as contemporaries, I really look up to what Ari Aster is doing, Jordan Peele, um, Mike Flanagan, Jennifer Kent. There, there's just, it's just an amalgam of a lot of different mixed bag inspirations that, like you said, they, 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 they're, they're in familiar territory, but I'm tackling them in an original way as much as I can. But um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of influences in Judy while maintaining an original storyline. Well, I got to hand it to you on another front because you composed all the music for Judy. Is that a, that's a correct statement? Yes. I composed and produced all the music for Judy. Yeah. I mean, you, that's one I've known. I know you a little bit about your background and folks watching this who don't know, you may not know that you were, you were, you know, very much a quite a, quite a, quite a skilled DJ at one point. It probably still are. And you were making and producing your own music um, for quite some time. Now, when you were creating Judy, was the idea to always do the score or was, were you, as again, was this like a pivot? You said, wow, I have to, I have a killer kind of rhythm that I think would go great with this as a, as a backing theme. Or was it always the intention? Like I have to score this. This is the way, this is the music I want to hear. So that's a multifaceted answer. I, I, A, always had the intention to score Judy. And as, as much as I can from here on out, you know, John Carpenter is a huge influence for me. He's probably my favorite horror director, and I really have a lot of admiration for him for produ uh, producing all the music. And with a 20-year music production background myself, going through various iterations and genres, um, I do intend to score, if possible, the all the, the rest of the projects that I'm putting on, but going back to all the rest of the projects that, I'm, that I produce, but going to Judy, 
the intention was to score this myself from the very beginning of the project. And you, you mentioned in the interview that there, it had like motifs of phantasm. Uh, for example, Judy's theme, which is, you know, the theme that revolves around our protagonist, that goes back to when I was a little kid, you know, you, you know, the piano motif that, that, that is kind of all throughout the, the short film. Yep. That, that is based upon a piano riff that I, that I wrote when I was like 10 years old after wow. I saw, after I saw Phantasm. Because in my bedroom, when I was a little kid, I had a little organ and I was, you know, I, I'm not a classically trained musician by any means. I just, you know, I, I, I noodle around on keyboards and synthesizers for many years, but that specific um, sequence of notes goes back to when I was a little kid. Because I remember watching Phantasm when I was like eight or nine years old and I loved the theme. I loved the score to Phantasm. So that was kind of my riff on Phantasm and you hit, you hit the nail on the head. That that is primarily where Judy's theme was stemmed from, but that riff was written when I was a kid. And I've always had that riff um, in the back of my head, like I'm gonna use that for a project at one point in time. And then maybe, you know, Carpenter has done this with his scores as well. Like maybe I'll save that riff and use it for a bigger feature. It doesn't mean that it has to live in Judy world. I can always change a couple notes and, you know, continue that motif on a feature length project. but. That piece of music means a lot to me. And it goes back to when I was a little kid that I wasn't producing music when I was a little kid. I was just sitting in front of this organ that my parents got me. It was a desk organ and you pull the front up of it and it had a little organ on it. That was just something I uh, wrote when I was a little kid and it happened to have made it into the Judy project. So it's there's a lot of uh, decades of dynamics going into the music production, but I'm sitting here in my home office here in Flagstaff, Arizona, and what you guys can't see is, you know, I have my studio monitors here, down here, I have my, uh, my MIDI controller, and basically it was just, uh, all right, let's, let's go through the production of Judy, and then uh, let's split the screens, put Judy on one half of the screen, and put Ableton Live on the other half of the screen, and score the thing, and uh, I would say 20% of the, the, the score, 20% of, of Judy had pre-existing scored music placed in it. And then the remaining 80% of the score was meticulously scored to the visuals. So that's, that's, a, that's a fun dynamic with the, um, like some tracks were already made, let's place them in, edit to, edit to score. But a vast majority of the score was done live to the visuals. Yeah, I, I mean, the music's such an important part of the, of the film. And, you know, we, um, it's funny because some movies, you know, kind of the music is almost there to, it's not supposed to be noticed. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of there as a background to, to not have silence. But in the case of Judy, I can't imagine it without the music at this point because of just how much it signifies the tone of what's going on and help adds to the the dread that's kind of you're seeing on screen and that's what good scores do is they make what you're seeing on screen more visceral more real um and so in the case of judy's score i just think uh again you know the, the inspirations um there's familiar territory but at the same time it does sound new and it says and it does sound perfectly placed in what you're seeing uh on screen which again sometimes you know as I'm sure you've probably seen, there's plenty of horror films out there that sometimes just miss the mark when it comes to the score because it doesn't feel um, native to what you're seeing or it doesn't feel germane to, what, to what's supposed to be happening. Um, and, and I want to pivot a little bit to think about the financing because I know in the past you've financed a lot of your own, you know, your films yourself. So I'm wondering what was the role and how did you finance Judy? And then what advice would you give to other filmmakers, you know, particularly ones who are looking at you or other folks like you and aspiring to kind of do their own, kind of go out there and make their first films. What was it like to get financed? How'd you finance Judy? And then what advice would you give to others that are looking to do something similar? So let me take a moment before we pivot. Let me digress a little bit back into the score just for about 20 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, granted, Judy, it's not a feature film. It's a short film, but I have never spent as much time on a musical ensemble as I did on the Judy score. Like, like you mentioned, I have a vast musical background. Like it went from 
you know, five to 10 years of producing hip hop and electronica to the DJing and scratching. Um, but, but at, at this point in my career, I'm putting my energy into music production, into scoring to film, because that it's just, uh, they're, you know, they're, there's, it's, it's, uh, like you said, it's a very important part of the narrative and it heightens the visuals and it's, it just excites me to place music behind these, uh, riveting and, um, uh, visuals, long story short. So the Judy score means a lot to me. I just had it professionally mastered and it's 11 tracks and that'll be available for public consumption and for the Indiegogo backers so they can listen to the 11 track score of Judy. And I scored the tent as well, but that was a little, that was a far easier workload. <laughs> uh, the Spirit of Haddonfield, that was a free fan film that was scored from pre-existing arrangements. And Northern, I scored the whole film, but I scored pre-existing arrangements that I had paid for, like sound packs and stuff like that. But Judy, on the other hand, was all made on a synthesizer. So that's, that's just something I wanted to touch on really quick is the score to Judy means a lot to me because it has roots. And uh, I feel like it's probably one of the most ambitious musical pieces I've put on to date that I've produced to date. But to move forward on your question, as an independent filmmaker, we're all striving to one day get the opportunity to play around with an actual budget, you know, to see, to have a bigger production company come in and see like that kid's got talent, that kid's driven, that kid's devoted. Um, let's give them a shot. But until that day comes, independent filmmakers have to, at, in most times, independently finance their own productions. And I have always independently financed all of my productions, working the day job, putting money aside, shooting on weekends, shooting on days off. Um, and, and the same sentiment carries over with Judy. It was internally financed out of my own pocket. Uh, producer Brian Goff helped out with a little bit of the financial uh, needs that we had as far as like set incidentals, rentals, all that kind of stuff. But the whole project aside, we'll, we'll get into the, the Indiegogo portion, but the whole project was internally financed out of my own pocket once again. And that could be tough yeah. for the first time, for the first, uh, for the first time in my life, Judy, I maxed out a credit card for the first time on Judy. And I've never done that before. I'm usually pretty conservative with my credit cards, you know, saving them for bills and necessities and vitals. But you know, with production, stuff has to get paid for. People have to get fed. Day rates have to get paid. Um, but it's it's a labor of love, but it's also, you know, you got to pay for this stuff. And um, I'm hoping at some point in the near future, somebody sees that I have talent and will give me the opportunity to have a small budget, hire all the day players and crew, and uh, rock and roll with an actual budget. But until then, it's continually internally financing everything. Has there been any like lessons you've learned along the way about self-finance? Because I think it's, you know, one of the, one that's fascinating, I think, to a lot of folks that are aspiring filmmakers. And, and, and I say aspiring to the folks that haven't actually gone and created yet, right? Like I consider aspiring as people who have not taken the journey to go and create something. Um, and so, when you think about folks that are kind of in a position before where you are now, you know, what advice would you give them about financing or even self-financing? You know, is there anything that you say, Hey, in my experience, it takes, like, I thought I was going to need more budget for this, like visual effects, but maybe I actually wanted to, I actually needed it more for locations or, you know, set design. So is there anything that you've kind of picked up? You're like, you know, you think you're going to need this, but you actually probably going to need this. Some some tips to those out there that are looking to also self finance, but maybe are just a little discouraged about the process. Because again, it can be daunting to look down the face of a few thousand dollars you don't have, uh, you know, and you need to find um, to make something. I think the the main point that I'm trying to get at with that topic is, regardless of what the venture is, short film, feature comic book, graphic novel. I think it's 100% important for each individual creator to write within their means. And what I mean by that is, for example, about 
six or seven years ago, a roommate of mine, he wasn't a filmmaker by any means, he wasn't a writer, but he was really eager and ambitious to jump into the jump into writing. And he would come with, come at me with these all these ideas that he was really excited about, like, yeah, and then we put the bomb on the plane and then the plane explodes and, and then you know this happens and the atomic bomb goes off. And I was like, that's I'm really happy that you're feeling this excited and this ambitious, but you got to start writing in your means when you're an independent filmmaker, you know, because how are you going to finance the explosion? How are you going to get a visual effects team to, to create a, an atomic bomb that doesn't look sub sci-fi channel level? Not to say sci-fi channel is subpar, but you know what territory I'm, I'm diving into. So yeah. I, that, is, that is the piece of advice that I still use to this day. I write within my means. I use my home as a location. I use uh, our guest room as a location to cut down costs because everything costs money in production. So A, it's very important to keep your project and, and you're writing under the parameters of, you know, don't go writing a script that involves an atomic bomb or a plane have blowing up because you're not gonna be able to afford that. And um, it's gonna prolong the process. But if you write a simple narrative that is well written that has a lot of suspense and dread about two people talking in a car you know the classic hitchcock i believe it's hitchcock there's a bomb underneath the, the seat but you don't know when it's going to go off prolong that suspense there's many ways to mitigate um financial constraints and strengthening your storytelling if you just go about writing it well but um i think i answered your question there yeah Long story short, write within your means. And then the second, the, the second uh, part that I wanted to talk about was pre-production is so important for any budget. You know, plan everything accordingly, get your, your materials paid for, you just get everything set up because you don't want to show up on the day and, and have your makeup effects artist be like, oh yeah, like that's going to be an additional $300 or that's going to be an additional XYZ or you know, DP is like, oh, I got to rent these lenses for that specific look. That's going to be X, Y, Z. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. So get everything all planned out and in pre-production, talk with your producers and just, you know, plan it out as meticulously as you can because stuff always goes wrong in productions. You're going to compromise the integrity of certain things that you thought were going to go in a different way, but plan, plan, plan. You know, there's, a, there's the term fix it and pre- uh, well, fix it in post, but what it should be is fix it in pre. I, I can resonate with that because I think there's an old adage, which is um, if you uh, plan to fail, you fit, you, you, uh, or is it if you plan, or if you fa fail to plan, you plan to fail. Um, and so if you don't know, especially if you're working on, you know, a self-finance budget, um, or just working with, you know, again, independent producers where it's not, you know, you don't have a budget from the studio and you do have to be aware of what your costs are going to look like. So you don't run into snags and have to compromise your vision at a point when you didn't think you're going to have to. And I know that Judy's making quite a few rounds in the film festival circuit. And, um, and I'm curious to know, you know, what have the reactions been so far? I know you just had a showing at Days of the Dead and You've got some, you know, love to hear some of the, the awards and act and recognition Judy's got as well. But uh, what have been some reactions and um, has there and what's been the process for submitting films to festivals? Like how, what's, what's that? Is that do you like it somewhere in the middle? So I'm, I'm going to do it again. Can I digress for 20 seconds once more before I dive into the next topic? So for any aspiring filmmakers that are watching this, we live in a day and age where it's much easier to obtain higher production value. Like for example, 103185, the micro short film that I did with, um, or a uh, post Judy, it was just a fun weekend project. It was a nice palette cleanser. The whole project was produced on my new iPhone 13 Pro Max. And I shot it in 4K ProRes, 10 bit color, and it's kicking ass in the film festival circuit. And that's kind of, with that said, you don't necessarily need, for example, like busted my ass to get my cameras you don't need a red a red camera to tell a great story you can shoot a narrative and make it you know make a great little short film with an with an iphone these days um 
I'm not saying that you're going to obtain the highest of production values doing that, but you can if it's well lit. But uh, we just we live in a day and age where there's not as many constraints. Like I personally have never shot anything on film, 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter, meter, 16 millimeter, eight millimeter. I have ambitions to one of these days, but it all starts with scripts and any ambitious aspiring filmmakers go out and write a three to five page short film take your iphone learn composition learn some lighting shoot it and then uh learn the the rudiments of editing and put it together and then you're off to the races and then just continually um flex your skills and improve as a filmmaker i guess what i'm getting at is everybody has the ability to make films with a device that's in their pocket you know, I'm not saying everyone go out there, you need to shoot an iPhone video, but you can if you want to dive in and get your feet wet, move on to a bigger cinema camera, you know, Sony mirrorless, black magic, red, and eventually airy. But um, there's a lot of available resources out there that you can right now take advantage of. Adobe Premiere is a terrific editing programming. I've, uh, I've been using it for eight years. Before that, I used uh, Final Cut for seven years, and it's relatively affordable. So go out there and get after it. But to jump into the next question, Phil, uh, what was it again? Yeah, so you're making a lot of different rounds of the film festivals, and I'm just wondering, what have reactions to Judy been, and what's the process been like for submitting films to these festivals been like for you? So I'm not entirely sure what, the response, the critical responses as of yet, um, some of the people that have seen it, you included, it's very well received. But as with any project, some people are gonna think Judy is a horrible film. Some people are gonna think it's okay. And some people are gonna love it. That's just the reality of you know subjective art with anything. But um, as far as, as of now it's it's been pretty well received it's you know it's uh it's been acknowledged that people can see the progression in my career and that um the work that me and my small team put together on judy is is uh paying off because we busted our ass on this little short film it's it's just a short film but it's much more than that and the general reception has been pretty pretty damn good for judy so far and as far as the process goes so there used to be a, a website called Without a Box, which has since gone defunct. And now the only way to submit, unless it's directly through websites, uh, festival websites, the only way to submit to film festivals is a website called, oh my God, I'm, I'm on this site like every day and I'm brain farting, hold on. It's called uh, Film Freeway. So I've been using Film Freeway for many years now, and it's a perfect platform to search your uh, your films' respective genre. Our Judy happens to be horror, so I've been submitting submitting it to as many horror and horror adjacent film festivals as possible. And as of right now, it's been submitted to, I believe, ninety three film festivals, which is the most I have ever pushed a project. But that's how much I believe. That's how much I believe in Judy. It's, you know, it was a financial investment. But with that, it's going to put the project in front of eyes, which could potentially put the project in front of um, industry eyes, which could potentially open that door that I was talking about earlier about that kid's talented. Let's give him a chance. You know, let, let's give him a chance. He Look what he did with peanuts. Not to say that Judy was made with peanuts. It was definitely, a, you know, a nice little budget, micro budget for what we achieved. Um, yeah, that's, that's the process. You, you, you finish the, the production, get the deliverables, you upload them to Film Freeway, and then you're off to the races. You submit it, you get yeses, you get noes, you get nominees, you get final, finalist uh, considerations. You, you went, you know, if you're lucky, you win awards. And uh, Judy has won two awards so far. It's had a couple top three nominations. Um, couple honorable mentions and a, a good handful of official selections. So Judy is gonna be trudging its way around the film festival circuit for the next six months, possibly longer. 
Um, as much as I'd like to release this film for the general public at the end of 2022, I'd like Judy to run its due diligence in the, in the film festival for as many people to see it as possible. So I'm thinking possibly a first quarter 2023 public uh, release. I think 103185 might get released this October just because that was a little mini project. And um, just to, I took on 103185 just, you know, just to keep, keep, uh, keep producing because when you don't yeah. produce, you get, you get stagnant. And when you get stagnant, you go crazy. <laughs> so I, I, I'm like, I'm foaming at the mouth to jump into my next script, which is already complete. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's basically the ins and outs of uh, film festivals. I would love to attend all of them, but that's also a financial investment having to travel to and from lodging. And right now I'm, I'm not really in a position to do that. I'm saving for first and last month's rent, deposit, moving costs to try and relocate out to the Burbank area. So as much as I would love to go to these film festivals, if there's any in, in the Los Angeles area that we get into, hell yeah, I'm going to go to those or any surrounding three to four hours away. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a little day trip, weekend trip, but it's a little harder and a little less feasible to fly to Illinois for Days of the Dead Film Festival as much as I would have loved to be there. But I don't know. I love film festivals. I haven't, I haven't, I've been kind of out of the film festival attending circuit for a while. It's just a fun community of people that have the same interests as you that appreciate what you do and no one's there to judge everyone's very receptive and uh i hope that i can attend more soon but um attending film festivals is a whole different story than just submitting to them but sure. i will say to anybody that produces any projects attend as many film festivals as you can it's a blast you're going to do a lot of networking you're going to make new friends and uh, who knows, you might meet your next co-writer, you might meet your, uh, your next producer on your next project. It's just a perfect platform to meet a smorgasbord of creative individuals in the industry to propel you forward. There's been so many stories of people, you know, meeting folks at, at even conventions that have attached or associated film festivals there where, you know, you can have the opportunity to mingle with some folks who, you may have looked up to and even can ask like, hey, would you mind guest starring in my film or something? And they, there's all stories of, of people who just take that chance. But again, it's uh, being at that place where you can have that opportunity to either have the conversation um, and then make the ask or, you know, get your film out there and then have people say like, hey, I want to work with that person. And so as it makes the rounds, you know, I'll be looking forward to seeing what comes of, of the festivals that it attends in and also kind of what it brings your way as far as financing or even just someone saying hey we want we want to give this guy a little bit more money so we can go make his next thing um because it is it is something you build i've never heard of anyone making their first film and then all of a sudden the world opens up to them um it, it is it is you, you you hear about that usually in the, the news will always tell you it's their first film that got them there but you don't hear about the 10 or 15 films they made before that um that were the blood sweat and tears to get them to that point to touch on that a little bit as well like to, to digress back to you never know who you're going to meet at a film festival for for example this was a once in a lifetime opportunity that i happened to be at the festival at the time but one of my favorite and big inspirations the blair witch project i got the blair witch uh signed right there uh, by director daniel myrick signed the poster uh at idaho horror film festival 2019 i believe it was he, uh, Dan, director of the Blair Witch, Daniel Myrick, was at the film festival, and he not only was in the attendance or in, in the audience watching my short film, The Tent, who has the lead protagonist named Heather, who was <laughs> named after Heather and the Blair Witch, straight up. And I didn't know that he was going to, I didn't know that he was going to be at the film festival. That's where I drew inspiration for my character in the tent. The Blair Witch is a huge, a lot of, you know, that's a very divisive film. A lot of people hate it. A lot of people love it. I'm on the ladder. And I love that. I named Heather for Heather's character in the Blair Witch and director Dan Myrick happened to be at the festival. And when we were doing the Q and Q and A for 
uh, the tent, I, I brought that up. I was like, I didn't know that director Dan Myrick was going to be here, but well, Dan, just to let you know, I named my, my main character, Heather, after your character in the Blair Witch. And he was like, all right. And then after the screening, this is where it got really special. I had the opportunity to watch the Blair Witch Project with director Dan Myrick and a small intimate crowd of about 30 to 40 people. And what made this so special was Dan Myrick's teenage, young teenage son was in the audience watching the Blair Witch for the first time. And during the and during the Q and A, uh, it was just really something special to have his son just ask question after question after question to his dad about the process of making the Blair Witch Project, and that is just one example of what going to a film festival can do for you. You're going to meet some of your, you know, some of your idols, and um, I happen to have met Dan Myrick, and he's a great guy, and I hope. Hope to work with him one day. I think it was Mad Monster in Arizona where I met up with you a couple of years back, but I yep. um, happened to be outside at the time and I was smoking a cigarette with Lance Henriksen. And I'm like, this is wild. Like Lance Henriksen just sitting, standing right here. Um, and I think when you go to these conventions, I mean, now it's, um, now that COVID is, well, well, it's not gone away, that's for sure. But um, now that restrictions are loosening and if cons are starting to come back a bit more, these opportunities to mingle with folk and just kind of be around people you admire, or people you've you've you want to you want to know more about. Um, it's surprising how humble the horror community at large is, and they're great storytellers. Um, so I think just for the simple fact of going and hearing people tell some stories you may not hear other places um, is very well worth the price of admission. Let alone if you're an aspiring filmmaker, it's a great place just to ask for. You know, shoot your shot, so to speak. Yeah, that that definitely where it was, where we met up, and uh, the highlight of that event, obviously, it was terrific catching up with you. I hadn't seen you in many years, but the highlight for me time. personally of, of that event was getting a uh, D. Wallace signed photo and getting to chop it up with D. Wallace for like twenty minutes. You know, I, I told her something that hundreds of people have told her, like, "You are my favorite movie mom." You yeah. raised, <laughs> you know, so the you same <laughs> You said that to her? I was like, I was like, you don't realize this, but you're pretty much my mom from like the movies. Like, I don't see it any other way. And she's like, oh, that's so sweet of you. And she was the most, just she, talk about a great person, like between her and Felissa Rose, probably two of the nicest people and most gracious with their time. But um, yeah, she is, she is all things to all people our age, I think, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, Dee, when I, when I told her that she laughed and she's like, honey, I'm a lot of people's favorite movie mom. <laughs> But um, yeah, a funny little story about that Mad Monster trip. This would have been an awesome opportunity, but I just got nervous and didn't. You know that that little um, dining area where we met, where yeah. we were having food in there after the film festival where some of the celebrities and people were mingling during the karaoke hour, Lance Hedrick, Hendrickson and Wes Craven, or not Wes Craven, uh, Freddy Krueger, uh, Robert England. Robert England, yeah. We're sitting together at a table and I was just standing there by myself, you know, just kind of looking around, looking around. And I met eyes with them a couple of times and I just still was standing there looking around, observing, observing. And I looked at them one more time and Lance Hendrickson looks at me and he goes, come here. And I got all nervous because he was sitting with uh, Robert England. I was like, oh, <laughs> I just got up and left. I just, I don't know why I should have sat down and met with them but I did not because I was just kind of starstruck. And um, yeah, that's- the Happens to the best of us. I mean, there is, yeah, I think it's, uh, there, it takes a special kind of person, I think, to be uh, absolutely comfortable just introducing themselves to anyone and everyone. Um, I wish I had that competency sometimes, but yeah, I, I would be like you and probably overwhelmed with, uh, like I always get embarrassed at the pictures I get at these conventions because I always feel like it's the worst version of me. Because I'm so nervous uh, of like trying to put on the face that I want everyone to see. <laughs> I hear you, man. I'm definitely a uh, introvert slash extrovert, depending and contingent on situation. You know, with directing, you very much do have to be extroverted. You have to let the let the people know what your needs are. But I'm trying to find the happy balance. But, yeah, uh, it takes all kinds. <laughs> and. Um, I have a couple, a uh, couple other questions for you here, because what does I'm going to kind of expand things a little bit to look 
as horror as a genre, you know, you mentioned that Halloween is your favorite horror film. Is that the film that got you into horror? And if you had to add kind of others, like what are your, 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 your major inspirations in the horror genre, aside from Halloween, what is that what the one got you into it? And are there any others that you look at as being, these are my, these are my go-tos whenever I need a jolt. You know, John Carpenter's Halloween, as far as I recall, one of my earliest horror memories going back to when I was probably four or five years old, maybe younger, I'm not entirely sure, but it's in the subconscious somewhere back there. One of the earliest memories I have was living in Nogales, Arizona, and in my, my parents' room, my parents were like in the living room, my mom was cooking dinner, and I was on the other side of the house in my room, and I heard, I heard like this... I heard this theme that I'd never heard before in my life, which happened to have been the theme to Halloween. And uh, being a, a little kid, I, I walk into my parents' room and on the TV, it was Telemundo. It was the, the TV channel was Telemundo. Halloween was playing with Spanish subtitles. And I remember watching portions of Halloween and I was at such a young and impressionable age feeling this visceral new kind of fear that I'd never felt before. And I feel like that's why Halloween has had such a lasting impression on me because, you know, we, we're, all, um, we're all chasing the dragon for that feeling <laughs> and that initial feeling that stuck with me upon seeing the shape chased Lori strode down this this uh this street I just remember at the time being like why is this happening you know it, 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 having such a young impressionable age not seeing anything like this before like am I supposed to be watching this is this why is this guy chasing her with a knife I don't get it and I feel like the allure of that is what kind of sucked me into horror and it's just kind of had a lasting impression but John Carpenter's Halloween is just uh it's just such a perfect movie you know and I mean granted some of the the acting's a little hokey and John Carpenter has, you know, certain qualms with it, but Halloween has been such a huge influence for me. And uh, amongst many others, like right here, I'm going to go ahead and flip the Logitech around. I got my VHSs of, you know, uh, yes. of, all the, of all the main heavy hitters that have inspired me. Of course, you got to have a Teen Wolf in there. Of course. And then, uh, and then uh, Back to the Future is my all-time, all-time favorite film and John Carpenter's Halloween is my favorite horror movie. So um, what was the question again? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I resonate with the Halloween as well, because that was the first horror film I remember seeing. Like, I don't know if I saw one before that or not, but I remember the mask terrifying the hell out of me. And I so much so that I used to stay at my Nana's house uh, on the weekends and she let me watch whatever the hell I wanted. So clearly it was always horror movies from the video store, but she had this rule that I had to turn off all the lights when I went to bed or else she'd get real mad at me in the morning. So, you know, classically as a young child, you know, you're terrified as shit of the face of the, the shape, you know, the mask is, is what sticks with you more than anything. You know, the, the, there's no, there's no, you don't have a voice to put to this person. You just see that mask. That's all you kind of see. That's all I saw in the dark. So I had this routine that I had gotten down to a science where I would turn on the right amount of lights so that I could make this loop around the house. So that the dark was always behind me, but never in front of me. Um, without fail, I'd always miss one too. Or they had to go back and do it all over again, scared shitless. But there's that impression left, you know, that feeling of terror persisted for such a long period of my, of my young life. The sad thing is, I think as a horror fan, you can tell me whether you agree or not, it's really hard to get back to that place because you end up consuming so many films that what becomes, it becomes less scary, more entertaining. But I'm curious, one, for you, like, are there any films that have made you feel the way Halloween originally did? And oh, yeah. if so, which ones? And I'm glad you asked that question because, you know, as bringing up prior, Chasing the Dragon, this is also a divisive film and um, some people hate it, some people love it, but that feeling I felt during seeing Hereditary. Hereditary got under my skin and it was just the right amount. I love psychological horror and Hereditary fucking got under my skin in that theatrical setting. Um, let's see what else. 
you know, people also kind of a divisive production, paranormal activity. I really liked mm -hmm. that movie. And that was also a huge platform for me. Like, wait, the director shot this with $14,000 in his own house and created a franchise and, and started Blumhouse Productions. That was, that was Jason Blum's first producing job, as far as I know. Don't quote me on that. But paranormal activity, the constraints and grounded nature of it just made it that much more believable. And that's why it really resonated with me, like Blair Witch did. Like what director Dan Myrick and I um, can't remember the other director, what he did. I remember watching the Blair Witch Project at 14 years old, 15 years old in 1999 in a black room um terrified i was absolutely terrified and i think the blair witch project did that to me as well because a motif that i continually exercise in my personal filmmaking journey is theater of mind suspense and sometimes what you don't see is what fucks yeah. you up classic classic jaws right there um the end but, of blair um, witch still to this day is one of the best and most terrifying endings because you don't need to see what you're not seeing to know that it's not good. Yeah, <laughs> you see it, just enough to terrify you. It gets your imagination cooking. And that's, that's kind of the motif I took with Northern. Northern's kind of an ambiguous story, but I took that uh, less is more, um, don't show the shark type of um, mentality. And uh, you know, that kind, of, that kind of filmmaking isn't for everybody. No. You know, that's, that's why a lot of people possibly hate Blair Witch because they want to see a knife go into a stomach and entrails spill out. You know, on the contrary, I, I do like that stuff, but on the contrary, I love theater of mind style filmmaking. And that's what fucked me up with Hereditary. It's like, where is this going? What is happening? The sound design is just incredible. The, these, these actors are incredible. This, this plot is just so twisted and the scenario is just, ah! Um, another movie that really, um, really, that really worked for me was Green Room. Oh yeah. At an, at like, an intensity uh, level, that thing, um, I have never been that on edge and in, in quite so, well, up to that point, right to that movie, there's very few movies that can keep you kind of that wound up for so long. So one, uh, I'll share a little tidbit on possible upcoming productions that I might be doing, but something that I'm currently writing, I'm gonna say it's an amalgam of um, Mandy Meets Green Room. Color yeah, Me Curious so. on that one, because those are two pretty outstanding productions um, coming from two different angles as well. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fun, and it, it, it's, um, it involves a rock band. And um, it's kind of stemmed from my five years of playing in a band, but um, that that's one that's the that's the feature that I'm currently writing, and then um, the short film that I'm currently writing is is pretty fun. It's definitely a departure of, from Judy serious filmmaking, serious uh, what's it called um, high, high high concept art, high concept whatever pretentious bullshit. <laughs> um it's uh the, the next short film i'm doing it's it's gonna be fun it's it's kind of horror satire and it's a nice breath of fresh air from two years of serious serious judy serious i'm gonna have some fun on this next one and then i'll dive back into darker territory with the longer um rock band script that's awesome well i'm i always love when when horror and music mix um, particularly when it when that's the kind of a topic because um, there is plenty of great films under the heavy metal horror genre um, and anything that and usually just for whatever reason I don't know what it is music just goes so well with horror um, like that that being a backdrop there's so much to be done with it that still hasn't been and some great under seen movies like Black Roses or Trick or Treat you know that kind of use that as a focal point hell even The Gate is very much kind of a heavy metal horror movie in a way Oh, I love the gate. Um, even though it's not directly. I, I didn't see the gate until I was in my mid to early 30s and it blew my mind. I was like, this is the coolest movie ever. Why didn't I see this when I was young? The gate is fucking awesome. After we um after we're done recording, I'll pitch you what my next script is. It's I've, it's it's gonna be okay. a fun one. Well, I've got one more question for you. And 
this is kind of my 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 fun you know like you had to program a triple feature of you know here's here are here are what here are what you are like these are the three best horror movies or the only three horror movies that represent you as a, as a filmmaker what three are you putting on there man i feel like i've already acknowledged them but hmm we've got halloween in there so i feel like halloween's definitely sounds like halloween it's probably a shoe in for at least one of those spots shit man like that's kind of a going back and forth but definitely possibly halloween the shining hereditary or halloween the shining jaws i'm a sucker for late 70s 80s as you are um yeah. i do i do appreciate a lot of contemporaries but I'm definitely more inspired by, you know, the likes of The Thing, 1982's The Thing. Um, well, let me put this a little differently. What's a genre that, are there any subgenres of horror that you, you aren't super interested in? Because for me, like I can say personally, like there's a level of like the extreme hardcore horror stuff. It's usually not for me, um, yeah. you know, and like, I, this is no knock to anyone that it is for, but you know, it's it's just usually not my my jam. But are there any subgenres that you're like, yeah, I, I stay away from it, even though I might have respect for it, but I stay away from it. One hundred percent, you hit the nail on the head. I I do not gravitate towards extreme horror like that, torture porn, any of that shit. It's just not for me. It's just yeah. uh, mean spirited. You know, granted, we don't go into watching horror movies to feel enlightened and you know, <laughs> light at the end of the tunnel. But that's that's just not my genre. Um, let's see what other genres am I not that crazy with. Surprisingly, I'm not going to tell you what happens in Judy, but you'll know this. The genre that Judy eventually goes down, it isn't one of my favorites. Yeah. It isn't one of that. my favorites, but that's just the story that presented itself when I went to the McAllister Ranch. Like, this is the story that I have to tell here. But other than that, I'm not the craziest fan of XYZ type of movies. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really sure of what other subgenres I'm not too crazy about. I'm not really uh, that into like, well, I mean, I dig The Exorcist, but like any, any films are deeply rooted in Catholicism or or uh, kind of like non exploitation. I don't know. Religious horror. Yeah, religious horror. I'm not really into that. Um, sometimes, even though Judy has been has been acknowledged of that, sometimes I'm not too into folk horror. Um, <laughs> it's a hit or miss I, genre for me. But I feel like that's what's important to me about Judy is subverting my own expectations on what I can produce. Mm. You know, like, I, I, I don't want to be blasé and just produ produce the same thing over and over and over again. I got to, you know, dive into different subgenres and challenge myself as a filmmaker. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think there's, that's, I think that's something that's really understated largely is that in order to become, I think, the, the creator you want to, you have to explore things that you are not intrinsically drawn to you know like i think that you become a better creator well i guess it, it serves you in most regards you know i'm not on the creative side but for me a well-rounded appreciation of different types of genres of film helps me know what i like and also what i don't like more but it also makes the experience of viewing film that much more engaging because i can look at it like stranger things i was just talking with the, my colleague lowell who writes on the site about this and that stranger things is kind of uh an overwhelming amount of nostalgia to the extent that for me, it can almost get in the way of my enjoyment because I'm constantly saying like, oh, that's from this, that's from this, as opposed to paying attention. And so I find that there's a balancing act around, you know, being able to use that as a, as, as influence but at the same time, not make it the only reason why it exists, you know, like inspiration versus influence. That's, that's something that I definitely learned during the, uh, the spirit of Haddonfield as well. You know, I'm constantly evolving as a filmmaker myself and constantly learning how to progress as a writer, director, producer, whatever, X, Y, Z. But with The Spirit of Haddonfield, I, I, I added a lot of Easter eggs in there. And to the extent of, you know, now it's been four years 
since I've produced that short film, I'm just like, maybe I didn't need half of those because you're pulling the audience out of your narrative if they're constantly focusing on, oh, there's the rabbit in red keychain, you know, there's a, a Haddonfield um, newspaper. It's just, it's a fine line of being on the nose, tipping the hat, paying respects. With Judy, I try to shy as far away from that as possible and retain as much originality as I could while remaining somewhat familiar. But um, that's, that's kind of my mindset moving forward with any production is, we get it, you're a horror fan. You, you produce horror films, we don't need to see. I guess I did add some, in 1031.85, some, uh, some inspirations in there, but uh, yeah, it's a final line. It certainly is. And Renee, I just gotta say, it's been great that, what is it? We're talking probably over 20 years now later. Uh, I'm interviewing you about a film you created. Um, so going, it's a long way away from watching Sleep. I think the first time I saw Sleepaway Camp was that trip to that blockbuster. And really? um, yeah, and that, and that ending you, still- Do you remember day. that? That's what I you do. rented? I do. That's the only movie, I, I don't remember the other movie we rented, but I know Sleepaway Camp was one of them. Um, and it was I remember seeing the ending and not realize, and it, again, at the age we were probably like somewhere between 11 to 13, something like that, 10 to 13. Uh, I didn't really know what I was seeing at the end, but for some reason it terrified me. And I think it largely has to do with her face. Her face at the end of the movie is just, you know, burns itself in your brain. Um, so really quick, was I still, because I remember in those early days, I was still part-time living in Nogales and part-time transitioning living in Tucson. Was I back and forth then? Yeah, you were, I think uh, that's why I was there. You were there for a weekend. And so I think I came oh. up for a weekend and uh, yeah, they wouldn't let, I mean, again, we were fine at the time, but in hindsight, us walking to the blockbuster three to five miles away may not have been the, the safest endeavor, but we made it back. Uh, one, thing, one thing that I, I think that is important to acknowledge is how heartbroken Renee Rivas and Matt Orozco were in 1998 seeing Michael Myers get his fucking head chopped off in Halloween H20 when we saw it at the theater. Yep. I remember you and me were so butthurt walking out of the theater like, they cut his head off. <laughs> Oh, just man. to make just to make one right after that with Buster Rhymes. I mean, it, it uh, the, the Halloween franchise is a very um, if I if I wasn't a fan, it'd be, I'd, be, I'd have a much different opinion of it. But I can't look at it up objectively anymore because it's uh, funky. yeah. But you know, that's I, the older I get, the more I realize that it's okay to have these opinions. It's okay to have a different point of view on something you may have liked before. It's okay, and then that's why my favorite thing to do now is to watch movies that I haven't seen in a really long time to see how I still feel about them, particularly the ones that I didn't like, because so much changes um, in your tastes and your opinions and your point of view to the extent that you can find uh, maybe your new favorites in films that you might have discarded uh, at some point earlier in life. 100%, man. You got any last uh, rapid fire? Things for no, I think or... this is it. I mean, uh, first of all, for everyone out there listening, you know, Judy is making its way out to the festival circuit. So if you happen to be at a at a convention sometime uh, for the next six months, please check your film festival schedules there because it's a good chance you might be able to catch it. And it sounds like it might have maybe a wider distribution release maybe in next year. So um, we'll certainly keep you updated when as it comes through. But Renee, it's been an absolute pleasure having a chance to have this conversation with you. I want to thank you for being here. Anything last you want to say for, for anyone else listening or watching this? I just want to thank you as well, Matt Orozco and the Macabre Daily. Yep. That's, that's okay. I just want to make sure I said that right. <laughs> um, thanks for having me, man. This was a blast. I will talk horror and chop it up. No pun intended anytime. And um, it's been a pleasure. I'm glad that you dig what, what uh what i've been doing and hopefully one of these days we can collaborate on something and onward i can't wait judy i'm proud of it but i'm, I'm already ready for the next yeah well you we it, as with any good creator you know you can't settle for one thing you have to make more so we can't wait to see it we'll certainly be helpful here to get the word out of any other projects you're putting you're putting out there and um we will share more information about julie's wider release when it becomes or if it becomes available so thanks to you again to renee uh, good luck on, uh, with Judy and 103185 and your next projects. And we hope to have you back here again talking about them.